going to be rounding it out here tonight in Matthew chapter 27. One more chapter to go after this. And uh, of course there's another long chapter if you recall. Matthew 26 was 75 verses long, or 75 to 76, I can't remember exactly, but a very long book. And this one's, this one's right up there, long chapter, excuse me. So I'm going to try and get to as much as I can tonight. And there's, as I mentioned about previous chapters, there's just so much in every chapter. And really, as we kind of come to the end of the book of Matthew, I have to look back on uh, and just say, I kind of feel like uh, the didn't really do it justice, you know, when we went through it. I kind of went into the book of Matthew thinking, this will be an easy book to start out on. Never really preach through a book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Um, not to say that I feel like I failed miserably or anything like that, but just to say more so that the Word of God is just so deep and there's so much more to learn from it. I mean, we could start right over again and go right back to Matthew chapter 1. We're not going to do that, okay? but we could. And we could probably learn a whole new set of things out of it and other more truths, even greater and deeper truths. So it's just, I've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed going through the book, uh, book of Matthew. I hope you've enjoyed it too. But uh, anyway, getting into it here, we're going to look at Matthew uh, 27, verse 1, where it says, And when the morning was come, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put them to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him unto Pontius uh, Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, which betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned, and that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down uh, the, the pieces of silver in the temple, and departed and went and hanged himself. And if you recall, last week we went through uh, some of the traits of a Judas, you know, and how uh, Judas, you know, is one who sneaks in, one who uh, begins to affect those that are around him. And we see here another attribute of a Judas, and that is, is that uh, Judas's are without excuse. You know, Judas is without excuse. We read this story, and sometimes people can maybe start to feel a little sorry for Judas, start to think, oh man, he, he realizes at the end of his life that, or at the, not at the end of what well, it was the end of his life, he didn't really know it at the time, but you know, when this takes place, when he sees what happens to Jesus, he starts to feel a little sorry, a little bad about the things uh, that he did. You know, and that's really no excuse for what he did, though. I and mean, we can't really right. excuse Judas for what he did. I mean, really, what did Judas think was going to happen? I mean, he knew uh, what the Jews thought of him. He knew what the Pharisees wanted to do with him. Uh, he wanted what all the uh, what they intended to do to Jesus. And he knew full well when he betrayed Jesus Christ, uh, in, in all likelihood, exactly what was going to happen. It wasn't going to be anything good. I mean, that's why he had to go and do it secretly. That's why there was money involved. He had to be bribed to do it. I mean, that's why it took Satan entering into his own body and compelling him to do these things. All right. So Judas really is without excuse because it's obvious what was going to happen. And what we can learn from Judas is that, you know, Judases are often motivated by money, you know, and we should never allow that to be our motivation in life. We should never let that same attitude creep in. No, we might never go as far as a Judas to the to the to the point where we would uh, you know <clears throat> betray Christ or we would choose money uh, to the point where we would do uh, ill to God's people, but that attitude of letting this the love of money creep in because that really at the end of the day that was Judas's problem it was his desire for money I and mean, he had the bag and what was put therein and we remember last week when he was complaining about the 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 the, uh, the, the box the the alabaster box of ointment that was. Uh, you know, given away. I mean, it's because he coveted those things. You know, because it was he thought it was a waste. You know, saying, "Oh, it's for the poor," but he really, inwardly, it's because he desired money. And we shouldn't let that creep in. And really, what verse five shows us is that even Judas, you know, when he feels so guilty. He cast down the pieces of silver in the temple, and you know, it just shows us that money isn't everything. You know, there's more to life than just money. You know, having a good reputation, you know, having honor, having a good name. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches. Yeah. You know, and, and the Bible says in Proverbs 11 that riches profit not in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivereth from death. You know, uh, Judas's 30 pieces of silver wasn't going to get him to heaven. I mean, he was reprobate anyway. There was no way he was going to, you know, that's a whole other sermon right there. But the fact is, is that money doesn't, you know, isn't everything in life. And that's one thing we can learn from, from Judas and his motivations were wrong. The Bible just talks about money a lot in that way. It reminds us over and over again that we should not you know, labor not to be rich. Cease from thine own wisdom. 
You know, 1 Timothy 6 is a, is a great uh, uh, passage about money. It says, But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. I mean, what a picture of Judas right there. A man uh, that desired to be rich, desired to have money, desired to have wealth. And what did he do? He drowned himself in destruction. He drowned himself in perdition. Why? For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. I mean, the love of money and making your life revolve around money is going to lead you down a dark path. You know, and, if, and, and people sometimes, they come into wealth, and if they're not careful, if they don't guard, uh, guard their heart, that, that wealth can corrupt them. That rough, uh, wealth can destroy their life. So we need to take a note here of what you know Judas, uh, Judas's uh, motivation was, and really at the end of it all, he just casted away anything because he realizes it can't do anything for him anyway. It can't change the fact that he's made certain decisions in his life that have ruined you know his life and affected others. So what's interesting though, if you would, of course, keep something Matthew 27, but go over to Acts chapter one. Is, um, you know the Bible just kind of tells us there in Matthew 27 that he throws down the silver in the temple, he departs. And then he goes out and he hangs himself, right? And it kind of leaves it there. That's kind of the end of the story with Judas here in Matthew. But in Acts, we see a little bit more detail about uh, Judas's death. It says in Acts 1, beginning in verse 12, of course, this is when the 120 are gathered and, and on the day of uh, Pentecost. It says, Then, uh, then returned they unto Jerusalem uh, from the Mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, the Sabbath day. And when they were come in, they went into an upper room where both uh, abode Peter and James and John and Andrew and Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon Zelotes, and Judas the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women, and Mary the mother of Jesus and with his brethren. And in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the, the disciples and said, the number of the names together about 120, Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled which the Holy Ghost spake by the mouth of David, which, uh, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which guide to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us and obtained part of this ministry. Now this man purchased the field with the reward of iniquity. And then it gives us some more detail. And falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. So, you know, there's a little bit more detail into Judas's death. You know, of course, hanging is not a pleasant thing. But, you know, when we read it here, it seems like his death was even a little more gruesome than we're first told here in Matthew. And one thing we can take away from this is the difference in narratives. And one thing that's always important to remember is when we're reading the Bible to understand when is the narrator, which is the Holy Ghost, you know, speaking through uh, the author of the book, you know, which is just stating the facts of the story. When are we reading, uh, is a statement that, and when is it something that a character in the Bible is saying? Now, in Matthew, it's the narrator speaking. It's the Holy Ghost speaking through the author when he says he went out and hanged himself. And it just leaves it there. But when we go into Acts, we read where it's Peter actually speaking. It's just the Bible's just telling us what Peter said. And it says that he fell headlong and burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. Now, <clears throat> we read those words and we can kind of let our imaginations you know, picture what took place there. Exactly how did that happen? I mean, what is the falling headlong you know we know he hung himself did the did, i wonder i try to think this through and maybe maybe it's a little car to sit here and dwell on this point but I, it's in the bible so i think about right. it you know he, he he hangs himself and it says that he's falling headlong i wonder if after he hung himself or during the process if the rope had broke and he and he fell on something and burst asunder or or maybe he just it was hanging and it was so heavy that it literally tore his body apart i mean his bowels are gushing out you know, it's, it's a little more gruesome, you know, it's a little more detailed here. But what's interesting is that that's Peter's narrative. You know, it's not the Holy Ghost. And it comes, sometimes it just kind of goes to show us that, you know, God says enough. You know, of course, this isn't anything wrong or gruesome or something that shouldn't be in the Bible. But it's just showing us that sometimes God just says enough. To where, you know, the, 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 the more gruesome details aren't necessarily the most important thing. You know, we read about how it's a little bit more gruesome and, and because Peter's kind of telling the story. But when God tells a story, He says, "You know what? He just went out and he hanged himself. Right. You know, He's not trying to give the kids nightmares. You know, but when we read Peter's event, you know, it gets a little bit more detailed. And you know, and again, I'm not saying Peter was wrong to say this or it's wrong to be recording the Bible, but it just shows us that sometimes maybe 
you know, we might have a, a tendency to take things a little bit farther than God might, you know, when we start to discuss certain things, and maybe we should just kind of, you know, just say, you know, he hung himself, get the children, and that's all you need to know. You know, because it would, I mean, for you read it here, it's a gruesome death. You know, and I don't want to go any, take it any further than Peter has, and maybe I have already a little bit, but, you know, I think Peter was kind of pushing the envelope already, you know, so <clears throat> I thought that was kind of interesting to see the difference between the way God tells the story, you know, just kind of brief, just kind of summarizes it in the way Peter recalls it and says, oh yeah, I remember his, God, his bowels gushed out, you know. <laughs> Maybe he had a little bit more, you know, he took it, you know, Judas somewhat personally and just really wanted to give him another ding. Right. Out. <laughs> but <clears throat> one thing we can definitely learn about this is that a Judas's life uh, never ends well, does it? A Judas's life never ends well. I mean, they might think they have the world by the tail, they might think they've got everything, you know, they got their 30 pieces of silver, they're in with the, with the, the powerful crowd, you know, they've got the power of Satan on their side, whether they realize that that's what it is or not. And they think they're really something, and they think that they're getting something done, and that nobody can touch them. But at the end of the day, their life doesn't end well. And it's not any better for them after that. Right. You know, and really what we can learn from at least Peter's narrative, you know, literally his bowels gushing out, you know, what we can take that from that figuratively is that what's inside of Judas at the end of the day is exposed. You know, at the end of the day, we get to see what's inside of a Judas. At the end of the day, we can see what's in their heart. What's really inside of Judas comes out of them eventually. And everyone gets to see it. They can't hide forever. You know, eventually it's all going to catch up to them. And they're going to be exposed. <clears throat> so, but, you know, the Judas says, you know, their reputation goes on. Their life ends. It doesn't end well, but their reputation goes on, doesn't it? I mean, you just, no one's naming their kid Judas. Right. Because he's got a bad reputation. You know, there's probably a few other names that some of us in the, our room, the, the people that we've known, uh, you know, in this ministry that have been a, a type of Judas. You know, I'm never going to name my kid any of those names. You know, <laughs> there's, and I don't even want to mention from the pulpit. I'd rather the earth just opened up and they, they fall into the abyss and we forget Amen. them. Amen. Because they're Judases. You say, well, that's kind of harsh. But well, you know what? Look, what? look what happened here. Right. You know, and we don't see... The, the apostles having a pity party right. for Judas. Huh. In fact, we see Peter kind of taking it to the next level and say, oh yeah, you know, right. he, and this is what happened to him. <laughs> you know, this, he burst asunder. So, <clears throat> anyway, we'll move on from that point because there's a lot more to get to. Look there in verse 6, and it says, And the chief priest took the silver and said, It is not lawful for uh, to put them into the treasury because it is the price of blood. Oh, how holy these guys are, right. you know. It's okay yeah. for us to give it to Judas for him to go betray him. Right. But now that it's here, you know, well, let's not let's not defile the temple. Like, mm. They wouldn't want to do that. I mean, hypocrites, you know, you can see why Jesus got so just mad at these guys. They're such hypocrites. Yeah. And they took counsel and brought them, uh, bought with them the potter's field to buy strange to bury strangers in. Wherefore that field was called the field of blood to this day. I mean, there you go. That's Judas's bad reputation living on again, right? They, 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 they know, oh, that's the field of blood. That's where Judas went out and hung himself. You know, that's where out his, his, his bowels uh, gushed out and he burst asunder and he fell headlong. It's the field of blood. You know, being a Judas earns you reputation, a well-earned one, and it sticks to you. You know, it's not just going to go away. In verse 9, it says, Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, And he took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued, uh, whom they of the children of Israel did value, and they gave for them the potter's field, as the Lord appointed me. And Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And, and Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest. When he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he said nothing. Then said Pilate unto him, Hearest thou not how many things they witness against thee? And he answered him, never, uh, answered him to never a word, insomuch that the governor marveled, marveled greatly. I mean, I'm sure this guy, Pontius Pilate, has probably had people come before him begging and pleading for their life. You know, probably even innocent people, you know, as Jesus. You know, it doesn't sound like it's necessarily the most, uh, you know, efficient uh, judicial system that's taking place. They're just bringing him to one man and saying, he's guilty, execute him. You know, uh, so, <clears throat> I'm sure he, why does he marvel greatly at this fact? It's because this is probably something that <clears throat> he doesn't see very often. He's probably used to seeing people grovel. He's probably used to seeing people pleading with him. Or who knows what their reactions are. Maybe they do get some. You know, Barabbas probably went for him at some point. Maybe Barabbas just doubled down and started cursing him out. Who knows? You know, I'm just kind of throwing that out there. It's all conjecture. But why is it that he marvels greatly? 
at the fact that Jesus says nothing. Uh, you know, because of the fact that he probably heard a lot of a lot of people trying to plead for themselves. But <clears throat> really, what Jesus is showing us here is an example to follow. And I won't have you turn there for the sake of time. We got a lot to get through. But in First Peter two, it says this: For even here unto ye called, because Christ also suffered for us. So we're called unto this. And what is he telling? And, and here's why: Because Christ suffered for us, we're called unto this, uh, leaving us an example that we should follow in His steps. So these are the steps of Christ that we are to follow. This is the example of Christ that we are to follow. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Uh, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. You know, that's the attitude we're supposed to have as Christians. You know, when, we're, when we do no sin, when someone's reviling us, when someone is, uh, you know, accusing us or saying something negative about us, and we're not guilty of that, you know, we don't always have to defend ourselves. You know, we don't even have to go on YouTube and every idiot that leaves a comment on the channel go back and stand up for us. Right. I mean, that'd be a full-time job. Right. That would keep you busy. That would keep you up late into the night. You know, and, and but here's the thing, you don't need to do that. Right. Or, you know, for the example, and you know, you go out soul winning. You know, we have that guy today. What are you selling? You know? Right. I've said, I'm selling nothing. I'm giving out an invite to church. Smile on my face. You're selling God. No thanks. Bam. <laughs> Did I get all upset? I can't believe that guy. We laughed about it. Right. You know, it, was, it was funny. Yep. You know, it's to the point of humorous. Some of these guys. Um, they're, now, that's not to say I haven't had people at the door get me a little more riled up, you know, and, and, and say things about me. I mean, this is something we grow into and to say, hey, you know what? I, that's fine if they think that about me. Look what Jesus did. I mean, he's being drugged before Pilate and accused, right. and he's being he's facing death. I mean, normally when people would be pleading for their lives, groveling, saying it's not true, don't do this, I'm innocent, he just takes it. He takes it right on the chin, and that's the example that has been left for us. That when he was re he was reviled, he reviled on again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. And, you know, it's not that if you just back down and let somebody trash talk you or say the negative things about you or your family gets after you about that church you joined and the way you're living now and they're down on you for all these things or, you know, people at work are going after you, making your, your, your life hard. You know, people, because people do try to persecute people and, and, you know, maybe not obviously to this degree, but they do it in other ways, you know, on the, on the job force and families, you know, in the world. They go after them. If that happens... You know, you need to just commit yourself to Him that judges righteously, and just leave it in God's hands. You know, the Bible. You know, we we read it and say, "Oh, the Bible says vengeance is fine." No, that's not what it says. It says vengeance is mine. You know, leave it in God's hands. Let Him take care of it. You know, He'd do a much better job of of, of repaying uh, our enemies than we ever will. Right. You know, and it's our 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 job is just to suffer wrong and and, and to let God handle it. <clears throat> anyway, we'll move on here where it says. Uh, you know, and of course that's easier said than done, but you know, that is what, what we're told to do. In verse 15 it says, uh, Now at the feast the governor was wont to release some of the people a prisoner, whom they would, and then a notable uh, and they had, they had then a notable prisoner called Barabbas. The, you know, Barabbas is an interesting character because um, you can kind of, you know, and this is really a good lesson on the fact that there's multiple interpretations of scriptures sometimes. There's always like a primary meaning. But the Bible is so deep that there's other meanings that we can, even within this story, I mean, this is a literal story that took place. And then Barabbas would be like a, a typology. He would, be, he would be a representation of somebody. Right. And we can make applications and interpretations from there. You know, the Bible has many layers to it. And Barabbas is an interesting one because you can look at Barabbas and say, well, what does he represent? You know, we can say, well, he represents us. You know, he was a murderer. He was guilty of sin. He was destined to die. And Jesus came and his place, it took his place. Right. He was set free, but Jesus had to die in his place. So that Barabbas, in a way, is a picture of us. Barabbas is, is someone who's been condemned, someone who's guilty, and yet Jesus sets them free. Now that would be one interpretation. Another interpretation that I think is really good here is the fact that Barabbas would represent Satan. And you say, well, how would he uh, uh, represent a Satan? Well, the fact that the Jews chose him over Jesus. You know, they chose a murderer over God. They chose a destroyer, you know, the devil, over the Son of God. So that could be another interpretation. So the Bible is just, you know, and again, 
I just feel like whenever I'm preaching through these chapters, we're just brushing over things right. yeah. that we could just dive into, you know, and, and, and that's, but that's a great truth right there. <clears throat> so he goes on and he says, uh, Therefore, when they had gathered together, verse 17, Pilate said to them, Whom will ye that I release unto you? Barabbas, which is called Christ, for he knew that for envy they had delivered him. So that's the true motive of the Jews. It's not because they just feel so vehemently about the fact that he claimed to be the Son of God. They just had to see this blasphemer put to death because you know they just they cared so much about the Word of God and God being honored. I mean, if they had, that was their true motive, they would have embraced Jesus. They would have seen his works and, and heard his words and understood. But their true motive here it was envy. You know, and if you would turn over to uh, John chapter twelve, John chapter twelve. You're going to John 12, I'll read you from John 11. You can see uh, in other Gospels this envy coming out of them. It says in John 11, you're going to John 12, Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. Yeah, and Jesus said, you know, If you believe me not for my, work, uh, my words, believe me for my work's sake. Right. I mean, uh, no man can do these things except God be with him. I mean, he's raising people from the dead. I mean, who, who can do that but God? <clears throat> so, you know, they understood that there was many miracles. They didn't say he's doing many magic tricks. You know, he's doing many, uh, you know, he's, he's by sorcery, he's deceiving the people. I mean, they had accused him of that. But it sounds like this, when they're having their little council, when they're getting together and it's just them, they're acknowledging the fact that Jesus did many miracles. And, and they, they say this in verse 48, If we let him alone thus, all men will believe on him. Well, wouldn't that be a wonderful thing, though? All right. If all men would believe on Christ, is that not the will of God that that uh, that Christ would have, you know, that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance? That He's the Savior of all men. That He would have all men to believe. I mean, that was what we would want. That's not what they wanted because they were envious. They didn't want all men to believe on Him. They wanted them to be beholden to them so that they would not lose their power. See, they were envious at the power that Jesus Christ had, the popularity that He had among the people. The, the following that he had gained. And they go, and, the, and they can even say, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. So they're just trying to hang on to the world, just hang on to their uh, false religion, hang on to their, you know, their little city and their temple, and just continue down, you know, living like the hypocrites that they are. Now you're there in John chapter 12, look at verse 42. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. That's the problem with these people. That was why they were so envious. They, didn't, they were envious of the fact that somebody else was receiving praise. They were envious that you know, when Jesus was coming into Jerusalem, they were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, you know, glory to God in the highest. They were telling him, hey, you need to shut these people up. Hearest thou not what these sayest? You know, and, and that was their true motive. Envy. They were envy of envious of the power that Jesus had. You know, and nothing has really changed today, has it? Nothing much has changed with the Jews today. They hate Jesus just as much today right. as they ever have. And they still desire to control people. They still want to trick people. They still want to deceive people to not follow Jesus, but to follow whatever way they deem fit. You know, and how do they do that? Well, they do that through Hollywood. You know, they do that through media. They do that through uh, the music entertainment. They do that through all these ways where they can just try to get into your minds. And make no doubt about it, Hollywood, I mean, this is just common knowledge. Hollywood, the music industry, run by Jews. Right. I mean, that's not far-fetched to say that. The financial industry, yep. run by Jews. Yep. The world is run by Jews. Why? Because their father is the devil. Right. And he is the prince of the power of the air. He is the god of this present world. And he has the power to give those kingdoms unto whosoever he will. And he's given it unto the Jews because they did his will. Because they chose the devil, Barabbas, over Christ. And, you know, he gives power to those that will do his will. Those that will go out and deceive. Those that will go out and trick. Those that will go out and make sure that they don't follow Christ. They're envious today, just as they've ever been. That's why they blaspheme Christ. That's why they try it again to just brainwash people through all these different means, through the public education system, into not believing on Christ. Because they want to retain that power. They don't want to give that up. <coughs> they say, well, that's pretty wicked. And it's wicked as hell. It's terrible. You know, we condemn them, and rightly so. But here's the thing. 
we even have to be careful that we don't let that same type of attitude creep into our lives. Now, of course, we're never going to go to the point where we're going to reject Christ. Obviously, we're saved. But this still, this type of envy can start to creep in where we want to control, not necessarily other people, but our own lives. Well, we'll say, you know what, I want to do what I want to do. You know, I don't want to, because, you know, we need to allow uh, God to have his way in our life. And the Christian life is a life of obedience, it's a life of submission to the Word of God. And a lot of times that goes contrary to maybe what we want, what we would desire. And if we're anything like, you know, we might have a little grain of the same attitude creep into our lives where we want to, we're envious and we want to hang on the power over our own life. Right? So let's not let that same, yes, let's condemn the Jews for doing it, but let's also be careful we don't let that start to creep in a little bit. Now, of course, we'll never take it to that degree, but we need to make some application here for ourselves as well. Now look at verse 19 back there in Matthew where it says, uh, <clears throat> When he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with this, uh, that just man, for I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. Application, men should probably listen to their wives every once in a while. I mean, you know, it's almost like God is trying to help Pilate a little yeah. bit here. You know, I mean, trying to like, hey, you sure you want to do this? You know? And of course it was going to happen, you know, and God foreknew that this, this was going to happen. But, you know, it, it really makes Pilate without excuse, right. you know, because he's another one that people try to let off the hook and say, oh, you know, he didn't really, he was just doing it because he had to. But, uh, you know, he was given fair warning. I mean, when his wife's coming to him and saying, hey, don't have anything to do with this man. And you see it in the scriptures, how he's going back and saying, you know, what evil hath he done? And they're saying, crucify him, he's going back. And said, tell me truly, if thou be the son of God, he's going back and forth and, he, and you can tell he's hesitant but at the end of the day he doesn't at the end of the day he pulls the trigger mm -hmm. so <clears throat> verse 20 it says but the chief priests and elder, elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask a barabbas and destroy jesus i mean it's that's just the perfect pictures of the jews today they work through the multitudes to accomplish their will they're not out front and center they 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 manipulate the masses and again i don't want to go off too much on a tangent here so i'm trying to keep this moving forward but in verse 20 it says, The governor answered and said to them, Whether of the twain will ye that I release unto you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate said unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, uh, which is called Christ? They all said unto him, Let him be crucified. I mean, he's trying to, to get away from this. And he knows where it's headed. And the governor said, Why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. Again, they didn't have any, any ground to stand on. What evil had he done? Well, he did this and this. There was nothing. They just wanted to get right to the execution. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but rather that atonement was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Hmm. Now, was Pilate innocent of, that, of his blood? No. Nope. He wasn't. Pilate was still guilty. Right. I mean, you can wash your hands all you want, Pilate. But at the end of the day, you were the one who made that decision. Right. And why is it that he made that decision? It's because he feared men more than God. He feared more, you know, he feared losing his position. He feared the fact that somebody might tell on him to Caesar and, and, and he might get in trouble with his boss, or that atonement was made that he couldn't persuade them, and maybe there'd be an uproar, you know, and he would have to deal with that. And the Bible even tells us, you don't have to turn there, but in John 19, Jesus answered, speaking to Pilate, He said, Thou have, could have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. So it's true, it's the Jews that have the greater sin, right? But that doesn't mean Pilate was without sin. You have to have sin for somebody else to have a greater sin than yours. Right? So Pilate still had sin in this. He was still guilty here. It's just that he wasn't as guilty as the Jews. <clears throat> and there it says uh, in, in, in that same passage, and, and it was the preparation of the Passover at about the sixth hour, and he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king, but they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto him, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he delivered them, uh, therefore, unto be crucified, and they took Jesus and led him away. So ultimately, he, therefore, uh, he, he then delivered he them, uh, therefore, unto them to be crucified. I mean, it was within Pilate's power to stop it. But at the end of the day, he delivered him unto them and allowed it to take place. Right. <clears throat> now, in verse 25 of Matthew, uh, verse 27, is probably one of the most chilling verses 
and prophetic verses. You know, I won't say the most, but it's definitely one of them uh, that you'll ever read. He says there, the people answered Pilate, and it says in verse 25, then answered all the people and said, his blood be on us and on our children. I mean, we read last week, you know, where the Bible says, be not hasty to utter anything before God, for thou art on the earth and he is in heaven. I'm kind of paraphrasing there, but it's saying, you know, don't be rash to, to, to utter anything. You know, don't make an oath before God. Don't make foolish vows. I mean, this is a really bad one. Yeah. And you say, why is it? Because they said, His blood be on us and on our children. And you know what? So it is. Right. And so it is. True. His blood is still on them. Their, their guilt is still... It's, it's, I mean, go look at the history of the Jewish people. They've been chased out, out of every single country in the world, practically, uh -huh. for centuries. I mean, persecuted, scattered. I mean, just... This is prophetic. They're saying, let us be judged for it. And that's exactly what happens. Yep. I mean, within 70 years, they lose the entire city. The Romans come and sack it, tear down the temple, and make it illegal for Jews to go into Jerusalem anymore. I mean, God judged them severely for this. And you know what? Rightly so. And you say, well, they, were they really guilty? How can you say it? Well, go over to Acts chapter 2. You know, actually, you know what? Go to 1 John. Go to 1 John 2. I'll read Acts 2. In Acts 2, verse 22, Peter says to these people, Ye men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you. So he's saying, look, God approved him. How did he prove him? With miracles and wonders and signs in your very midst, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. It's not that they were ignorant of these, th these things that Jesus did. He did them plainly. Jesus said, I taught plainly in the temple. I taught daily in the temple. Yep. I did everything out in the open. He didn't hide what he was doing. They knew what the miracles were. They saw the signs. They saw the wonders. <clears throat> Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. So who does God ultimately lay the blame of the crucifixion, the death of his son? At? It's at the feet of the Jews. And he follows through on that. He gives them exactly what they asked for. His blood be on us and on our children, and so be it. And that's why a lot of Jews are just hardened to the things of God. A lot of them become reprobate. They're wicked people often. And look, you say, well, that sounds awfully anti-Semitic. And you know what? It is. It is anti-Semitic. And I'm not afraid to be labeled that. Right. Because I'd rather side with God Amen. than the enemies of Christ. Amen. And I'm not going to be beholden to some people that, quite frankly, are a fraud. Right. And aren't even actually you know, physical descendants of right. these practically. They're just claiming some religion. That's right. you know, I'm not hating on an ethnic group. I'm hating on a wicked religion Amen. that yeah. blasphemes Christ, that says some of the most wicked, detestable things that you could ever hear spoken about our Lord right. that aren't even you know a fit to uh, utter in, 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 in this church right. or in any setting at all. Yeah. I mean, wicked, horrible things are spoken by him, by, about Him by these people. That's right. And they would have all men to reject Christ and to embrace their, their philosophies, their devilish ways. Yeah. <clears throat> and you say, well, that's anti-Semitic. Well, I'd rather be anti-Semitic than anti-Christ any day of the week. Amen. And you say, well, how can you say they're anti antichrist? Well, let's turn over to 1 John and see what, what makes a person, you know, antichrist. <sighs> you say, well, they're still God's people. They still have the Father. They still worship the same God. No, they don't. Amen. Nope. They don't worship the same God as us. Nope. That's right. God has rejected them. Mm -hmm. They worship a false God. And that's nothing new. They did that. They've been doing that throughout their entire existence. And go read the Old Testament uh -huh. and see how many times they worship false gods. Like that's some big shocker to us. First uh -huh. John chapter two. Look at verse twenty-two. <clears throat> you know, some verses to memorize tonight. Who is a liar but he that denieth Jesus is the Christ? He is an antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. The Bible is showing us here that anybody that denies Christ, that denies the Son, is an antichrist. Amen. Okay, so if you, people want to get upset that we pick on somebody who denies Christ, go ahead and get upset. Go ahead and get mad about it. I'd rather be on God's side. Amen. Verse, 20, uh, verse 23, Whosoever therefore denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father, but he that acknowledges the Son hath the Father also. Right. So you can't sit there, and, and I've had people, come, you know, Christians come up and say, well, you know, they still worship the same God as us, and they have the Old Testament. You know, we're a Judeo-Christian nation, blah, blah, blah. You haven't read your Bible, friend. Yeah. You haven't turned here and read this. 
because it says right here, anybody who denies Christ is an antichrist. If you have not the Father, if you have not the Son, the same hath not the Father. Mm -hmm. It's plain as the nose on your face. So, again, worthy of a whole a series of sermons to be preached out of. But verse 26, it says, Then released uh, he Barabbas unto them, gave them what they wanted, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. Now turn over to John chapter 19. I'm just going to throw something out there. This is something I've wondered about over the years when I've read this. Things that I've even preached a sermon on this back when we were up in the building in Newark. You know, like one person maybe. <laughs> but, you know, maybe it'd be worth another sermon. I don't know. It's still not something I'm completely clear about, but it's... Again, the Bible leaves itself open to interpretation in some areas to make it so that we as preachers and, and believers can make application to our lives. Amen. But in John, so you notice there in Matthew it said they stripped on him and they put on him a scarlet robe. Right? It's very specific about the color. Then look at John 19, look at verse 5. Then came Jesus forth wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. So it's it's purple now. So I've had I talked to people about this. Well, what, is this a contradiction? You know? And because, because I mean, it's clear. I mean, his scarlet is is not purple, right? right? That's two different colors. Scarlet is is a, is a shade of red, right? And purple is purple. Right. <laughs> anyway, we know what purple is. Right. So we got two different colors here. People explain, well, maybe it was both. Maybe one person saw it as red, and maybe saw it as purple, and you know, maybe, maybe that's what it was. In Luke, he gives us another account. I'll just read to you from Luke 23. And when Herod and his men of war were uh, uh, set him at naught, they mocked him and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him again to Pilate. So maybe what made it so gorgeous was the fact that it was two different materials woven together, some scarlet and some purple. You know, maybe that's what made it such a, a nice robe, that you had two different materials, two different colors. You know, back then, we take it for granted now. I mean, I've got a coat on that's, you know, 10 years old. You could probably tell. But, you know, the, the clothing is much more durable today. It lasts longer. It's much more abundant. You know, you're, which is why you're going, why are you wearing a coat that's 10 years old if the clothing is so abundant? You know, and we could go out and, and, and buy whole wardrobes today right. for like, you know, just pennies on the dollar, just yeah. at a, very cheap. But back then, to have a gorgeous robe, I mean, that was really something. You know, the uh, clothing, you know, I mean, we see in the Old Testament, sometimes people were rewarded with raiment. Right. You know, they were given sets of, of clothing because clothing was so hard to come by back then. It took a lot more work to produce. Mm. So maybe what made it so gorgeous is that fact that it was two colors blended together. Now what I have thought about is the fact that when you read in the Old Testament in uh, Deuteronomy and Leviticus where God is telling them how to build the tabernacle, God tells them that they will make the covering of the tabernacle out of certain materials and that they were to be scarlet, purple, and blue. Scarlet, purple, and blue. Those are three colors that you see coming up. And what do we see here? Scarlet and purple, right? Well, I, you know, and if the tabernacle, Jesus is kind of like, uh, that, that is a picture of Jesus in a way, that tabernacle that was on earth. You know, it, it, it kind of, there's a lot of symbology in Christ there, I mean, and God, the nature of God. So I kind of, this is just my, and I'm just throwing this out there, just to kind of provoke thought too, because I'd be interested, you know, maybe another guy could look into this and say, hey, if you consider this, or another sermon could be written by it. I like to just kind of throw these things out there every once in a while. Hopefully it doesn't lead into some deep, dark heresy, right? <laughs> it's not going to. But <clears throat> the thing is, you know, that's the covering that was on the tabernacle. Well, that's kind of the covering that was on Christ, wasn't it? Oh. He wore scarlet. He wore purple. Yeah. You say, well, what about the blue? Well, that would be the fact that he was bruised. Amen. That he was oh. beaten. He wore those blue, I mean, the blueness of a wound cleanseth the way evil, the right. says. Right, right. So, I, you know, that's just a thought I had. I preached a sermon about that, about maybe that was kind of a picture of, of Christ's suffering, you know, the mm. fact that he would be put, a scarlet robe would be put upon him, that or a gorgeous robe that had both scarlet and blue in it, or purple in it, and then he would also have the blue wounds that he wore. So, anyway, you know, anyways, you know, think about it. Anybody guy has any other thoughts? I, I'm always interested in hearing that kind of stuff. So, just an interesting thing in Scripture. I don't think it's a contradiction, the fact that you have two different colors mentioned. Amen. You know, because it clears it up there in Luke, a gorgeous robe. So it's probably the fact that they both colors were there. You know, maybe one of the maybe one of the narrators was a little colorblind. You know, <laughs> you know saw a certain shade. I don't know. But uh, anyways, your thoughts on that would be interesting as well. But moving along here for sake of time, in Matthew chapter uh, 27, verse 29, verse 29 it says, and when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. 
And they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head. I mean, the, just the mocking and ridicule that Christ suffered. You know, we ought, whenever we feel like we're just suffering, uh, you know, for the cause of Christ, we need to go back and read these scriptures. Uh, yep. And say, you know, someone called me a dirty name. You know, or someone said, you know, something like that. Well, have they spat in your face yet? You know, maybe. Maybe somebody has. I've, I've had somebody spit at me. It wasn't for the cause of Christ. You know, it's for bad driving. <laughs> but and it hit the windshield, you know. But, uh, and I, I'm sure, I, I know people that have been spat upon for the cause of Christ, but, you know, have they had a crown of thorns put on their head? Did they take the weed and smack it on your head and dry those thorns into your flesh? And, anyway, he goes on here and says, after they had mocked him in verse 31, they took the rope from off of him. And we just read over that, but that's a, that after having been whipped right. and having that rope taken off, I mean, all the, all the clotting that had taken place while that robe was on and reopening all those wounds. You know, I preached, I know I preached not too long ago about the, the, the death of Christ and we went into detail on some of these things. But it's always good to kind of be reminded again and again the suffering that, you know, Amen, yep. remind us how much God loves us Amen. and the things He endured. Okay. And put His own raiment on Him and they laid Him away to, be cru to crucify Him. And as they came out, they found a man uh, of Cyrene, uh, Cyrene, Simon by name, and they compelled Him to bear His cross. So if you remember, you know, Jesus had gotten so weary that he collapsed under the weight of that cross. And then they find this other man coming out of the field. He was coming back from a journey and they compel him to pick up his cross and take it and bear it for Jesus. And really, you know, again, applications that we can take from a literal uh, circumstances and apply to our lives. That is kind of the picture of the Christian life, isn't it? You know, every man must bear his own burden. You know, we are, Christ said in Matthew 16, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. You know, Simon of Cyrene was probably had somewhere else to be. Probably didn't wake up that morning and go, oh, i got to go bear Jesus' cross. You know, he probably had plans for that day. He probably had his own will to do. But somebody else compelled him to pick up that cross, and he obeyed. He did it, right? And that's kind of what we have to do as Christians. You know, we have to be willing to pick up and identify with the cross of Christ and bear that same uh, burden that he bore. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. So we got. I'm just going to move through here pretty quick, just to, for sake of time. But Matthew, uh, in verse 33, excuse me, it says, And when they were coming to the place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of the skull, they gave him vinegar to drink, mingled with gall. Boy, that must have been refreshing. After who knows the last time he had anything to drink. You know, where they give them vinegar. Now, I like a little vinegar, you know, in, this, in my in my water in the summertime. You know, I haven't been doing it this summer, but we should probably get back to it. It's good for you to put a little vinegar, but this is just straight vinegar. And it wasn't probably a apple cider vinegar. It was probably, I don't know what it was, but, I mean, it's pretty nasty. Right. Mingled with gall. It doesn't sound like anything good. And when he tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there, and set up over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, King of the Jews. Then were the two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and one on the left. And they that passed by reviled, wagging their heads, and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and us in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests mocking him and the scribes and elders said, He saved others himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him come down now from the cross and we will believe him. So they're just really rubbing his face in it. They're really just pleased with themselves, pleased how the day has turned out. I mean, they just couldn't be happier the fact that Jesus Christ is hanging from a cross. Right. And they are there to just mock him and ridicule him and watch him while he just you know, bleeds out and dies. I mean, these are wicked, evil people. <clears throat> Likewise, also, the chief priests mocking him uh, uh, with the scribes and elders said, uh, well, let me jump down and read that. Uh, uh, verse 44, the thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. So, if we recall, there were two thieves that were crucified next to him. Other, the other Gospels, you know, uh, cover this. And they're, they're crucified with him, you know, and they start out reviling, but if you remember, one of them, you know, gets right. One right. of them realizes, oh wait, this really is God. Right. You know, and, and actually says, you know, confesses him, says, Lord, you know, when thou comest in thy kingdom, remember me. 
remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. He says, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. So one of them actually got saved up there, you know. And of course, that's a great place to take, you know, the, the those that we believe have to be baptized. Right. Say, you know, show them, well, there's a guy getting saved. Well, that's an exception. You know, <laughs> well, anyway, that's, that's another thing we can go off on. <clears throat> but we're going to try and move through this. It's not an exception. You know, yeah. it's, a, it's, it's textbook salvation. That's right. Somebody yeah. seeing Christ die, uh, acknowledging him as, as, as the Son of God, and confessing him as Lord, and asking him to be saved. That's, that's how we get saved. <laughs> he says there in uh, verse 46, And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, uh, lamai sabachthani. That is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I mean, <clears throat> after everything he suffered, you know, in his darkest hour, he's forsaken by God. I mean, God had to turn his back on his son at one point. Why? Because he became sin for us. We knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God. You know, he became, he took upon him all the sins, the sins of the whole world. You know, all our iniquities were laid upon him. And God had to turn away and he couldn't look and he forsook his son. And, uh, I mean, that was something that, you know, it was so uh, just traumatic to Christ that he cries out here, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You know, I could stand up here and try to reenact maybe exactly how he said that. But probably something he cried out very loud with a lot of passion and a lot of emotion behind it, you know, but anything I could do would just come short. But we, we have to remember what's really taking place here when we read over these words that, you know, this is something that really happened. This is something that he really felt deeply. Some of them that stood there, when they heard that he had said that, said, this man called for Elias. And straightway one of them ran, took a sponge, and filled it with vinegar, and put on a reed, and gave him a drink. The rest said, let be, let us see whether Elias will come to save him. Jesus, uh, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. Now that's interesting that it's ripped from the top. It's like God reached down and you know. And you have to remember that. Uh, and plus, it showed it, it just proved to them that if they knew it was rent from the top to the bottom, we say, how did they know that? Probably somebody saw it happen. And probably somebody, you know, I mean, if you just walked up and saw two uh, the, the veil rent in half, and you're like, well, how did that happen? How would you know it, which way it was rent from? You know, probably somebody saw it happen. This stuff all got relayed and was told. I mean, there was probably quite a buzz going on at the time of Jesus. Right. I mean, people were probably talking quite a bit about all the things that were, were taking place. I mean, when Jesus later comes along with two disciples in the road to Emmaus, they say, you know, you know, art thou a stranger in Jerusalem? You know, have you not heard the things that have been taking place? I mean, this is something they talked about a lot. So I'm sure somebody actually saw this happen. You know, someone was there, one of the chief priests, one of the priests were there, and they saw this take place. And if you recall, that veil is what separated the the the, 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 the high priest, you know, from the, the holy place, from the holiest of holies. And God rent that veil and, and made made way in, saying, you know, showing us that, you know, that old system was done away. Right. That the way into the holiest was made plain through the blood of Christ. It was made through His His blood. And then a lot of other things take place that are quite interesting. He says, uh, <clears throat> and behold, the veil of the temple is rent twain from the top of the pot of and the earth did quake and the rocks rent. I mean, it, <laughs> this is, he gives up the ghost and then all this stuff starts taking place. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know how you could be there and not just start to shake in your boots. Right. I mean, you'd be like, whoa. <laughs> is that a coincidence? Mm -hmm. Your rocks are being rent. The veil the, gets torn in half. The earth is shaking. And, uh, and, and uh, the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. You know, the, all these great things are taking place. Now, of course, there it says in verse 53, and, uh, and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. So even at his death, and even after, you know, it wasn't, it, it, all these signs are taking place. And, you know, at least one of, somebody that was there actually acknowledged the fact that this, you know, it changed his heart. Now, the centurion, and they that were with him watching Jesus. This is probably one of the guys, you know, he was he definitely had a part in crucifying Christ, like literally crucifying. He was either commanding the men that were literally driving the nails through him or putting him up. They were sitting there watching him. All these things take place. And when he saw, and watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly. And what did they say? Truly this was the Son of God. Mm -hmm. You know, and at least somebody... You know, there that day got it right. You know, and who was it? 
It was the very people that put him there, you know, physically put him there. So we read all these things, you know, and this is something that I, I was talking about somebody recently is that because people say, well, you know, the Bible's just a book. You know, the Bible's just a book written by men, and it's probably just uh, things are exaggerated and so on and so forth. And, but here's the thing. Think about all the things that people write about in, in the world. Think about all the things that, that, that just, I mean, some things are important, some things are very intellectual, things are very helpful. You know, people write a lot of different things, right? And, when, and think about all the things that people record throughout history. All the wars. I mean, you could go study history. You could learn about world history. And how do we know all those things? Because people saw those things take place and then they wrote them down. Hey, the, the Bible's no different. You know why all these things are written down? Because they took place. Amen. I mean, if these things took place, don't you think somebody would write them down? Right. I mean, you know, some Hollywood whore goes out and gets a new handbag or something. And it's all over the National, you know, Enquirer or whatever. You know, U.S. News, or Us News is going to tell us the latest and greatest about Bradgelina or whoever. Yeah. I mean, all these trivial, trivial, uh, trivial, inconsequential things, all these details about the world yeah. are being recorded on a weekly basis. You know, people are following people around with cameras trying to capture every twist and turn of some Hollywood mogul, you know. So if, if someone came to Earth, you know, and claimed to be the Son of God, and then started doing all these miracles and teaching all these great things. Yeah. I mean, if someone showed up today and started raising people from the dead, right. that would be worldwide news. Right. Oh. And that's how we got in there. So it's not so far-fetched to say, to think that, of course those things would be written down. Hmm. Of course, if the rocks were rent and the veil was torn in twain, and if the dead rose out of the graves and showed themselves in the cities, you know, of course those things are going to be written down because they actually happened. Right. <clears throat> now, moving on here, again, i got to wrap this up in verse 55. It says, And many women uh, were beholding afar off, which followed Jesus from Galilee, Galilee, ministering unto him, among which was Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of Jesus, and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's children. When the evening was come, there came a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who was also himself was Jesus' disciple. He went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which had been hewn out of the rock. And he rolled a great stone of the door of the, uh, of the sepulcher, a sepulcher and departed. And there was Mary Magdalene and Mary and the other Mary sitting over against the sepulcher. Now the next day that followed the day of the preparation, the chief priests of the Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, remember that, what, uh, that that deceiver said while he was yet alive, After three days I will rise again. Command, therefore, the, that the sepulchre will remain sure until the, day, until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away, and say unto the people, He is risen from the dead, so the last heir shall be worse uh, than the first. So, even at the end, even after, after all those things, rather than acknowledging Christ for who he was, I mean, even, even do you think these guys knew about the fact that the veil of the temple got rent? Right? No. You know, and I, I haven't looked into it for myself, but I've been told that that wasn't just like a tissue in there. I mean, no human was going to be able to just reach up and tear the veil. That thing was thick. I mean, if you read about how it's constructed, it was, it was layered. And these guys are witnessing all these things. The veil of the temple. I mean, if you want, only one guy was allowed to go into that temple or into that holiest of holies once a year. And, he had, and, 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 and you know, if he was, wasn't right with God, he died in it. Yeah. And now they're, they just crucify Christ. They're feeling all fat and sassy, and they walk in their temple, and that veil's torn, laying on the floor. I mean, wouldn't you wake up at some point when the rocks are being rent, when the veil's being rent, when the dead are rising? You only think they'd snap out of it? I mean, the centurion did. Yeah, they, they went, whoa, this is the Son of God. Hmm. Whoops. Yeah. They, they acknowledged their mistake. Not these guys, though. Rather than acknowledge it, what do they do? They just start lying. Hmm saying, oh, you know, he said he was going to rise the third day, so let's seal it and set a watch. And, you know, we all know how that goes. If we get into it a little bit in the next chapter uh, on Thursday, about how, you know, you can lay all the plans you want, but if God, you're not going to stop God's purposes. Right. I mean, go ahead and put all the soldiers you want on there. That stone's still going to roll away. Right. Those angels are still going to show up. He's still going to walk out of that grave. You're not going to stop him. I don't care how many people you put there. And he said, a pilot said to them, you have a watch, go your way. Make it as sure as you can. So they went and made the sepulchre sure, sealing a stone and setting a watch. So it, it just shows you how pathetic those guys were. I mean, they're that stupid. 
And why is it? Because they would want to hang on to their power. And they were willing to believe a lie, I mean, even under this day. You know, they, they want, they, they just want to say, oh, the, the disciples came and took his body. Right. You know, but here we see that, you know, they made sure that that couldn't happen. And yet his body wasn't there. So, you know, they're, they're setting, and they're trying to set up, you know, they're trying to prevent that from happening, from the, the body being taken. But really what they're doing is just setting themselves up for even better, bigger fault. Because it still happened. You know, the body still disappeared. We know, of course, it wasn't the disciples' fault, but, you know, but it actually even proves the resurrection even more right. you know, than they did. You know, and all things work together for the good for them that love God. It just goes to show us. Anyway, let's go ahead and uh, word of prayer.